speech on Sunday when on Monday a child picks up a gun instead of an oboe. So for, for, so for me, I'm interested in what happens on Sunday, but I'm much more interested in happens on Monday through Saturday. Yes. I'm much more interested in the kind of formation that we are or are not doing for people that's up against a culture that says that the church is irrelevant, Christ is irrelevant, none of it matters, it's all relative, and uh, you just need to do what you need to do. So I'm interested in a formation process that helps people be Christian in the workplace, be Christian at home, mm -hmm. and, that, and that a Christian is putting an oboe in a child's hand on Monday. That to me is the church. That to me is worship. Yes. When I see 250,000 people on the mall on Washington, that to me is the church. So I'm not sure if Sunday and Monday don't meet, I'm not sure yes. what it's doing. Yes. If they don't meet uh, and are in conversation with each other, politically, socially, Econ economically, yes. I'm just not sure. And I don't think that God is pleased. And I think that God is not mocked and um, that, that, that there is an accounting. And I, I do not want to be in the line of fools. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Now to some general questions. Dr. Wright has already alluded to the question because being the the generous moderator that I am, I gave them a heads up on these questions so they wouldn't a little be shocked. A little bit of heads up. Yeah, little, little heads up. <laughs> Question, what is the black church not talking about and why? <laughs> what is the black church not talking about? And if you've already alluded to something, um, you want to revisit that, it's, if you want to bring up a new issue, what are we not talking about? For example. Okay. <laughs> how, do you raise all, how do you raise offerings? And, and how does language about tithes and offerings How do we do that in a way that has integrity, that doesn't do harm to people who are already marginalized by the system? So that's just the issue I, I don't think the black church talks about. Doing ministry is important. Generating income for ministry is very important. Uh, I've passed it before. You can't do ministry with no money. But you can also do some serious damage trying to generate income many times from people who don't have, don't have it to give. That's right. So that's kind of an issue that black church doesn't want to talk about. So I gave you all a little time. Do you like that? Okay. Yeah. See, see, uh, what are we not talking about? I think one of the issues, you know, one of the, the, the um, hallmarks of the current context in which we live is multiculturalism. And it's been um, alluded to earlier. One of the things, though, we, we are not talking about how, how to negotiate the new landscape. Um, we, and somebody, you, you talked about, you know, our young people not being raised in an era of blackness, and so they don't understand the civil rights movement. We're not, they don't, we're not talking about the cost of where we are. I mean, we haven't gotten that far, but where we have gotten cost something. And so you hear people say, well, what difference does it make? I think we're not talking about what it means to be black in a multicultural context and have a sense of personhood. I do think it's, reconciliation is important, but I can't have a reconcili reconciliating conversation with you until I know who I am. And so I think the black church, and, and we, we are always the ones trying to be polite. You know, we come to the table and we always come with our hat in our hand, kind of begging to be allowed at the table because we don't understand who we are. And so I think we, we have to give our young people, and it's not, 
the, the and I think what has been said a couple of times here is if we don't give them a compass, somebody else will. Yeah. So they do have a sense of personhood, but it's the wrong sense. And so they, they think gangster is blackness. They think um, being ignorant is blackness. They think being able to bounce a basketball is blackness. But they don't understand all of the potential that we as a people have. And so when they get to the table, they come as the underdog. And we come as the under, and, and, and it's, I will say, it's off-putting to be a black person with power. It's off-putting. When I come into a room and I don't take down and I sit at a table and look people in the eye, that's very threatening to them, especially as a black woman. I understand that, but I have chosen to live that way. But a lot of the people who we pastor, because we have, the Bible says something interesting, is don't be like the other leaders. Don't lord it over people. And we as pastors sometimes, they have this sugar daddy they can come to and unload to, but we haven't empowered our people, and we don't talk about that. We don't talk about the fact that we have uh, we have contributed to the situation that exists. And so, if we're going to be able to have a conversation going forward that gives us what we need—the economic, social, social, and and other types of power that we need—we need to know how to be in conversation with other people. And we first of all have to discover who we are. And I don't think as the black church. We, we have experiences, yes, and we say, oh, that was a black experience, but we don't even talk about what went into that. What went into the music that we sing? What went into our understanding of scripture? What went, we can't, you, I, I talk to young people today and they are very quick to dismiss something that they haven't heard before because they have no history. And I think we as a black church have failed to, because we want to be in this new context, you know, this, this, success context. We don't talk about struggle. We don't talk about what it's taken for us to get where we are. And so our young people have no foundation on which to build and to enter into dialogue and not lose themselves in the dialogue. Thank you. Dr. Wright, we're just revisiting uh, what is the black church not talking about. You can add to that. I agree with Dr. Alexander, Dr. James Washington, uh, at the 200th anniversary of the African Methodist Episcopal Church at the Hildebrand Robinson Lectures, pointed out the fact that after every revolution in Western history, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, even the Haitian Revolution, the victors, the winners of the revolution, wrote down their story so that subsequent generations would know what they were fighting for, what was won, what was lost, what lessons were learned. Everybody had done that except African Americans. Mm -hmm. So that we don't do as Moses said, we don't tell our children. They don't know their own story. They don't know what every Jewish kid knows. I went to school with Jewish kids in Philadelphia. Um, Central High School had 2,200 students when I was a student there, 2,000 of which were Jewish. Mm -hmm. 200 of us Gentiles, 60 Gentiles were black. Every Jewish holiday was mine. I took them all. <laughs> they wanted us to sit in study hall all day and read. Um, but all of my Jewish classmates had to go to synagogue school three times a week. They taught their own story. We don't teach our story. Kids in Chicago, well, and I'm speaking from a Chicago perspective, when I moved to Chicago, I had no idea who Harriet Tubman was. Then Mark Vesey gave her a process because we had not taught our children our story. So they don't know our story. They know his story. They can tell you what happened in 1812, 1776. They can't mm -hmm. name three African kings or queens because they're not taught African history. And they think we began in slavery. Yes. So we're not talking about who we are. Uh, last night when you were doing the introduction for Dr. A, one of the books it's not, her book deals with 100 years of African-American Pentecostalism, L.H. Welch, mm -hmm. and his history and heritage of the African-American church, a way out of nowhere, does not start in this country, he starts in Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't teach our children that, uh, so we're not talking about that. Uh, so that, right, they come to the table. Radical re Reconciliation, Radical Reconciliation mm -hmm. by Alan uh, Buzak and Curtis DeYoung, 
talks about the fact that we're not talking multicultural, multiracial, we're talking non-racial, mm -hmm. which means no race is superior to any other race, yeah. but each of us mm -hmm. embraces who we are mm -hmm. in our own particularity. Mm -hmm. Our kids don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to embrace because they don't have, they, they've not been given their history and their story as to who they are as a people. So I think that's one of the most important things that the black church has not talked about in the years that I worked in churches and still is not talking about. We just bag it and tag it, name it and claim it. Tap your name and give them a high five, tell them you're coming out. <laughs> Put your hands up. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Kelsey? I think we are not talking about power. I think we talk about empowerment. which is a word which speaks to the culture, the individualism of our culture. But power, God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and self-control. We are the largest, I suspect, one of the largest unorganized groups of people in the United States. <laughs> we have over a thousand denominations on the Protestant side unorganized. Mm -hmm. So how can we teach African history and really change the curriculum, because that's really what you're talking about, um, if we don't organize ourselves to do that? What do I mean by that? What I mean is an imagination at Louisville Seminary that teaches, that has a class, that teaches students um, African history that they can then teach in their churches. Any church, suburban, urban, rural, that teaches civil rights history, American history, African American history, Caribbean history, black history. That we teach that to people here in this seminary so that they can go and teach it in their congregations. So one is imagination, two is power, okay? What could we do if collectively we stopped competing with each other for people, for money, for pulpits, for prestige, for this is the world as it should be, not the world as it is. But if we stop competing for just a second and said what is it that we can do together that will help us, self-interest, and help our people. Okay. So I want to teach about power, and I also want to teach about sex and sexuality, because folk have it, and some people die from it, right? And if we don't teach it, who's teaching it? Yes. I mean, yes. what are kids, I mean, they're getting it yeah. in the street or whoever, whatever. So could we teach it in a way, could we teach sex, sexuality, intimacy, love, relationship, relationship yes. yeah. companionship, kindness, gentleness, that's complete counter to this culture. Could we teach that? Should we teach that? Yes, we should. Yes. Yes. Yes, we yes, should. Absolutely. That, to me, is life-giving yes. for young people, for middle-aged folk, for elderly people, to teach people together, the old folks, the middle, and the young together about our bodies, mm -hmm. the connection between body and spirit, mm -hmm. what it means to be in relationship with another human being what it means to be nonviolent in a relationship, mm. how, to, how to work on disputes so that we don't pick up guns and knives and fists and things of that sort. That's what, uh, homosexuality, yeah. intersexuality, heterosexuality, HIV AIDS, that these are the things that kids are dealing with, that middle class, middle, age folk like me are dealing with, elderly people are dealing with, and we're lost. 
we are lost. We get, I turn on the TV and I'm getting it, you know, the values of what, what's on that or on the internet. Where are we? Where are we? So what I would want to do is teach my students at seminary about all of this. And then let's teach and learn together so that our students can go out back into the churches and teach the people. Thank you. I designated this question for Dr. Wright, but I would just like to go ahead and open this up to all the panelists. The question is this, what does the murder of Trayvon Martin symbolize for many African Americans? Since you designated it for me, <laughs> um, for me it symbolizes that the system is working just as it was designed to work, which is to keep black people in their place. Mm -hmm. That's how the system was designed to work. We talked about it at dinner last night, the difference between criminal justice and the criminal justice system. And A. Leon Higginbottom in his work uh, in the matter of color points out that the system in this country was designed to keep black people in their place. He's a appellate court judge, Supreme Court judge, state of Pennsylvania, showing how every law that appeared on the books of the colonies before we were a country from 1630 to eight, 1787 was not based on legal precedents, was not based on jurisprudence, was not be, even based on English common law. Even though we were English colonies, it was based on the custom, whatever the custom was. What do you do with blacks? 1619 in Jamestown, there were no laws on the Jamestown colony because there were no Africans in that colony. 1630s, laws started appearing because Africans started having babies <coughs> by people who weren't African. So what race are these people? What, what do we do with them? They, those are the kinds of laws that started appearing. Racist laws, 150 years of racist law are in place mm -hmm. in 1787 when you get the Constitution, so how can you help but have racism built into the Constitution yeah. of the United That's the system you're up against. And what the constitutional lawyers don't want to tell you is about the word Constitution. Anybody here bake? Any bakers in the room? Yes. If I say, yeah, I like, before I leave here, I like a, I like, Vanilla cake, pound cake with, with chocolate ice in three layers. And you rush home at lunch, get some eggs and some milk and some flour and some baking powder and some vanilla extract, preheat the oven and put it in there. Ding, 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 ding. You pull it out and you say, I forgot the sugar. <laughs> you cannot sprinkle sugar on the top of that mess and call it cake. <laughs> because the constituting elements determine that it will never be a cake. <laughs> The racism built into the Constitution, you have some sugar on the top, y'all call them amendments. <laughs> All you got to do is scrape that sugar off. We had one piece of sugar called prohibition. There will be no whiskey sold in this country. We got rid of that one quick. <laughs> the 13th Amendment, sugar. It's ended slavery for everybody but prisoners. 14th Amendment, you made, made people citizens, now makes corporations citizens. 15th Amendment, trashed by the Supreme Court, pieces of sugar. South Africa did what? They got rid of that cornbread that they were trying to call cake and started all over with a new constitution where you have non-racial, no racist superior to the other. In our system, you're not even a person. 